Welcome to NOAA Rounds 5, Session 8. My name is Erin Kerwin, and I'm going to be facilitating this session. So please join me in welcoming our presenters. We have doc Dr. Beth Parkinson and Ms. Emma McManus. Beth Parkinson and Emma McManus are research fellows in health economics at the University of Manchester and are currently working on the diploma, which is the Diabetes Prevention Long-Term Multi-Method Assessment Program, evaluating the NHS Type 2 Diabetes Prevention Program. So today's topic is evaluating the effectiveness of the NHS Diabetes Prevention Program. Before I begin, I'll go over some event housekeeping. Participants will be muted throughout the webinar. So to submit questions during the webinar, please use the Q&A function. This is a friendly reminder that the Q&A function is different from the chat function, so we appreciate if the questions come through the Q&A only. The Q&A answering your questions will be facilitated during the final 20 minutes of the webinar. So thanks again for joining us, and I'll now hand over to Dr. Parkinson and Ms. McManus. Can you hear me? Yeah. So thank you, Erin, for that introduction, um, and thank you for the invitation to present our analysis. So this uh, piece of work is going to be um, evaluating the effectiveness of the NHS Diabetes Prevention Programme. And the work that we're going to present today is part of a wider research programme, which is an independent evaluation of the NHS DPP that's been funded by the National Institute for Health Research. So to start, I'll, quick with, uh, I'll, I'll start with a um, quick overview of our presentation. I'm going to first describe the kind of rationale and background um, of the programme. And then I will present my findings on the participants level uh, analysis and just to note that this is still a work in progress at this stage so I'd really welcome any kind of thoughts suggestions for this analysis um, and then I'll pass over to Emma who will present her findings on the population level analysis of the DPP. So starting with the background of the program um, we first need to know kind of what the rationale for why uh, this program was implemented. So type 2 diabetes is a chronic condition which affects um, how insulin is produced and how it functions in the body. And it's also associated with several other conditions, including heart disease, uh, stroke, nerve damage and vision problems. It's also a growing problem. So it's estimated that 8.6% of people aged 16 and over in England have type 2 diabetes. And the prevalence is expected to increase. To, um, 9.7% by 2035. Worldwide it's also a growing problem and it's estimated to be the sixth leading cause of disability worldwide. The condition is also costly to treat. Type, type 2 diabetes is estimated to cost the NHS 8.8 .8 billion pounds annually, um, which is equivalent to around 10% of the total NHS annual budget. Importantly, however, type 2 diabetes is largely preventable. Um, as the majority of risk factors are environmental, such as smoking, um, having a poor diet, or being physically inactive. And um, before developing diabetes, many people first develop what's known as pre-diabetes, which is a state of having elevated uh, blood sugars above normal thresholds below those clinically required um, for a, di a diagnosis of diabetes. And individuals with pre-diabetes are considered to be at high risk for developing type 2 diabetes in the future, but they can also return to normal glycemic control. So to combat this, the NHS Diabetes Prevention Programme was implemented as a joint commitment by NHS England Public Health England and Diabetes UK, designed to prevent or um, delay the onset of type 2 diabetes in adults um, identified to be at risk. The programme consists of evidence-based education sessions focusing on diet and exercise. And it was rolled out across England in three annual waves, starting in 2016, and it was available nationally in 2018. 
and to avoid placing additional burden on NHS services, the programme was commissioned to be delivered by four independent providers. So I'll briefly just describe how a person would typically access and progress through the programme. Firstly, a person would be identified as eligible, which means they have a blood test showing that they have non-diabetic hyperglycemia or pre-diabetes. Uh, secondly, individuals are then offered a place on the programme, which is usually done by their general practitioner. This is either done following a consultation or following a letter from the GP. Um, the GP must then get consent for the individual for their referral to be passed on to the programme providers. Uh, next, participants are then invited to attend an individual initial assessment where eligibility for the programme is confirmed and baseline measurements are taken. And it's at this point that we define an individual as having taken up the programme. Next, individuals are able to attend the group sessions. Three of the pro uh, providers offer a total of 13 sessions and one offers 18 sessions, which take place over nine to 12 months. And finally, they will complete the programme. The DPP define completion by a person having attended at least 60% of available sessions. So systematic reviews and meta-analyses of randomised control trials of similar behaviour change programmes have shown that them to be effective at preventing the onset of type 2 diabetes in those identified at risk. And early outcomes data indicates that the NHS DPP um, completion of the NHS DPP is associated with these intermediate outcomes such as um, reductions in weight and HbA1c and also that weight loss and HbA1c reductions were found to increase with the number of program sessions that were attended. So the research so far suggests that the DPP is having an impact on intermediate program outcomes but we don't yet know the impact um, on preventing type 2 diabetes. And we aim to do this in two ways, um, both at the individual level and at the population level, to answer whether the programme prevented the incidence of type 2 diabetes for individuals that took up the programme, and whether the programme made a detectable difference in population rates of new type 2 diabetes diagnoses. So on to our first study which evaluates the effectiveness of the DPP amongst participants. The aim of this is to provide the first analysis of the association between taking up the DPP and the risk of developing type 2 diabetes amongst those referred to the programme. We also examine whether the impact of the DPP varies by the level of participation in the programme. And just to make it clear which part of the pathway that, the, that we are going to be analysing here, the um, First two stages, the identif identification and recruitment are the responsibility of primary care services, whilst the remaining four are with the DPP providers. And it's this second part of the pathway from a referral being received by the DPP providers up until completion that we're going to be analysing in this study. So we use data from two sources for this analysis. The first is the DPP minimum data set, which um, DPP providers are contractually obliged to collect in order to receive financial reimbursement from NHS England. And this contains information on all referrals to the DPP collected from the beginning of the programme in June 2016 up until March 2020. The second source is the National Diabetes Audit data. This contains information from primary care records on individuals diagnosed with type 2 diabetes. And currently we have data that covers all diagnoses up to the end of March 20. And importantly, we're able to link these two data sets at the individual level, which means that we can observe whether or not individuals that were referred to the programme subsequently go on to develop type 2 diabetes within this data period. And just to more clearly illustrate the kind of time periods that we're going to be examining, we restrict the analysis cohort in the main analysis to individuals that were referred to the programme uh, by the 31st of March 2018. We know from previous research that the average time between initial assessment and completion is just less than one year. 
So this allows sufficient time for individuals to finish the programme within the period that we analyse. However, this does mean that we only observe referrals from the first two waves of the programme. And we do conduct some supplementary analysis where we include referrals up to March 2019, just to kind of check the consistency of the results to including those uh, wave three referrals. And in terms of the outcome, we're able to observe whether or not individuals were diagnosed with type two diabetes by the end of March 2020. So this means that we have a minimum of one year of follow-up past the point at which people should have um, completed the programme and up to three years follow-up after completion for people referred early on in the programme. And the average follow-up between referral and at the end of the data period was 31 months. So here are some summary statistics from this data. There were just over 180,000 individuals referred to the programme by March 2018, 46% of which did not take up the program as they didn't attend any sessions or the initial assessment, which means that 54% um, of referrals engage with the program in some way or so, to some extent. And 19% um, attended over 60% of sessions, which would have been defined as completing the program by the DPP. In the final column, we have the raw unadjusted rates of type two diabetes diagnoses in each of these groups. And amongst those that didn't engage in the program, slightly over 12% had developed type 2 diabetes by March 2020. The rates were slightly lower amongst individuals that attended the initial assessment and attended some sessions, but fewer than 60%. However, the rates were lowest amongst those that completed the program, um, with 6.7% of those having developed type 2 diabetes by March 2020. And we can also look at this in more detail by examining um, uh, diabetes rates across the number of individual sessions that a person attended. For simplicity, this includes um, data for individuals referred to the three providers that offered the 13 sessions. So it excludes referrals to the provider that offered 18 sessions. And here we can see that the rates remain at around 12% until session five. Uh, beyond which we do start to see a declining gradient in diabetes rates down to less than 6% for those that completed 100% of sessions. Here I've produced some figures just to show how the characteristics of individuals varied by the level of programme participation as well. So starting here with age, we can see that individuals that were retained in the programme longer were generally older than those that didn't take up the programme. So individuals aged over 65 made up about 42% of those that didn't attend any sessions in this top row, um, whilst they represented around 64% of individuals that attended the over 60% of sessions. And here we show deprivate, how deprivation varies by the level of programme participation. And we see that individuals that were retained in the programme longer were generally formed with um, less deprived areas compared to those that were referred uh, but didn't take up the programme. So for example, 23% of individuals that didn't attend any sessions lived in the most deprived quintile of the areas in the country. And this is compared to around 14% of individuals that attend over 16% of sessions. sessions sorry. So this demonstrates the importance of adjusting for patient characteristics in these sort of um, analysis as individuals that were retained in the program longer do appear to be different to those that don't ever take up the program or drop out. So using this data we estimate the association between participation in the DPP and the risk of developing type 2 diabetes using logistic regressions which we adjust for differential follow-up by controlling for referral months and we do this separately for Firstly, um, a binary indicator of uptake, which is defined as attending at least the initial assessment. We do this across different categories of participation that we saw earlier. So attending only the initial assessment, attending some sessions, but fewer than 60% of sessions, and more than 60 sessions of completion. And finally, we look at the associations across the number of individual sessions that occurred. And in these regressions, we can draw for a number of characteristics that are recorded for all referrals. So these are age group, gender, area deprivation, provider, and region. 
We also conduct two lots of kind of sensitivity um, analysis, the first of which assesses the impact of uptake amongst um, only those that have engaged in the programme in some way. Um, so for this, we restrict the analysis sample further to those that have attended at least the initial assessment. And then we define uptake as an individual attending at least the programme sessions. So this will show the effects of uptake over and above the decision to engage in the programme in some way. And therefore the estimate should, um, could be less uh, biased by self-selection to participate. But importantly, this also allows us to control for um, additional participant characteristics that are only recorded at initial assessment. So these are participant ethnicity, BMI, HbA1c, employment status, smoking and disability. The second set of supplementary analysis uses survival models with flexible follow-up follow periods to make full use of the data that we have on the timing of events because the DPP might also delay um, diabetes cases in addition to preventing them. Um, so we estimated the association between categories of participation and ABC diagnosis using COP proportional hazards, hazards regressions. And we first perform these regressions on the main sample, but then we also include an additional year of referrals, so referrals up to March 2019, just to check the robustness um, of the results to include in those wave three referrals. And now on to the regression results. The regression coefficients are presented as marginal effects, so they can be interpreted as the percentage point change in the risk of developing type 2 diabetes that's associated with DPP participation. This first table shows that amongst those referred, uptake was associated with a 1.7 percentage point lower risk of develop developing type 2 diabetes. So in relative terms, that means people that engage with the program in some way were on average 14% less likely to develop type 2 diabetes than those that were referred to the program but didn't attend any. And this next table then unpacks that average by looking at um, different levels of participation relative to attending no sessions. Attending only the initial assessment was not found to be associated with any change in the risk of developing diabetes. And this is uh, somewhat to be expected as the initial assessment doesn't actually contain any behaviour change materials. However, attending the programme sessions was associated with a statistically significant lower risk. And we find that larger reductions um, for, for people attended more sessions. So attending some but fewer sessions was associated with a 0.7 percentage point lower risk, but attending 60% of sessions or completing the program was associated with a 4.6 point lower risk. Um, and in relative terms, that's equivalent to a 37% lower risk of developing type 2 diabetes to attending no sessions. And next we have the regression coefficients for the number of individual sessions that a person attended here displayed graphically. And again, this is just referrals from the three providers that offered the 13 sessions. And like we saw in the untrusted rates, attending only four program sessions was not associated with a significant change in the risk of developing diabetes. However, beyond this, we see a steady reduction in the risk of as session attendance increases up to 12. Where attending the full 13 sessions was associated with a 5.7 percentage point or a relative 47% lower risk of developing type 2 diabetes compared to attending no sessions. What's also interesting to know here is that this reduction continues beyond attending eight sessions, which would have been 60% of sessions um, so continuing to attend sessions beyond what is defined as completing the programme is associated with an even lower risk of developing. Here we have the first of the sensitivity analysis where we restrict the sample to individuals that attended at least the um, initial assessment and assess participation relative to and in the um, initial assessment only. So the, in the first column, we have the same covariates that we include in the main analysis and find that the regression coefficients are very similar to the primary analysis. 
which suggests that there's not much impact of selection at um, initial assessment. And after adjusting for the additional covariates that are recorded at initial assessment, we do find a slightly larger effect of attending some sessions, not 60%, but exactly the same effect as attending over 60% of sessions. And finally, the survival models. So the first, the first column uses the same sample as in the main analysis and the same set of covariates. And here we find that the hazard ratio associated with attending over 60% of sessions is 0.59. So individuals that attended over 60% of sessions were 40% less likely to develop type 2 diabetes compared to those that didn't attend any sessions over our analysis. And in the second column, um, we see that that effect is similar, if a little larger, when we include the additional year of referrals, um, which also includes referrals from wave three of the programme. So to summarise these results so far, uh, uptake of the DPP was associated with a significantly reduced risk of developing type 2 diabetes amongst individuals referred to the programme. There was evidence of a dose response relationship between the level of participation in the DPP and the risk of developing type 2 diabetes. Uh, the results suggest that a minimum of five sessions were required or 40% of program content before any statistically significant changes in the risk of developing diabetes were observed. And beyond this, risk decreased and was lowest amongst those that completed the full program sessions. However, only 2.9% of individuals referred completed this 100% of sessions and um, were the largest reductions in. So as I mentioned, uh, this analysis is still a work in progress and the next stage is we plan to explore methods that will allow us to address the potential endogeneity of participation. So we know that um, the allocation of individuals to the DPP and the level of participation is not random and there are many potential sources of selection bias. For example, patients self-select into taking up a referral but they also decide their level of attendance with the programme. So this might mean that our estimates of the effect of the programme are biased. Um, so the first method that we've proposed to examine this is whether um, predictors of attendance can be used as instrumental variables. And here I've put some examples that we're going to be kind of examining. So uh, these are the day and the time of sessions, the size of session groups, and the incentives that are given to program providers to encourage. Um, um, so yeah, but thank you very much for listening. I'm gonna pass over to Emma now. Hi everyone. Um, so now it's my turn to talk about another piece of work that we've been doing evaluating the diabetes prevention program. So instead of it, it looks at the population level effect of the DPP. And just quickly, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Emma McManus, and thank you very much for allowing me to talk to you today. So why is it important to consider the effects of the program at the population level? So whilst there is quite a lot of evidence that diabetes prevention programmes can work, these are often with, within controlled settings and amongst highly selected individuals. As such, these estimates may be an overestimate of what can actually be achieved in the real world. It may be that this level of effectiveness cannot actually be scaled up or that the provider, private providers delivering the programme actually have different effectiveness rates. There is also the need for the programme to have sufficient reach amongst the at-risk populations, which means that they're reaching the people that look to benefit the most. And this is not something that is usually tested within the controlled trial setting. And lastly, there may also be wider effects that are captured in individual level evaluations. So, for example, the programme may prompt increased identification of pre-diabetic individuals, which may in itself help to prevent type 2 diabetes. 
So this is the first study, which is looking to estimate the population level impact of the NHS DPP. So to carry out this analysis, um, we use data from the National Diabetes Audit. So this is one of the data sets that Beth has used in her work. Um, but just to quickly recap, it contains data on all individuals registered within practices in England who have been diagnosed with type 2 diabetes. And so from this data set, we generated practice level counts of the number of new type 2 diabetes cases diagnosed each year. And we did this from 2010 to 2019 and calculated the incidence rates of type 2 diabetes per 1000 eligible to benefit patients. So here we defined eligible to benefit um, as those that are above 15 years of age and not yet diagnosed with type 2 diabetes. We also used information provided by NHS England on which practices were enrolled in each wave of the DPP. So to analyse the impact of the DPP on population level incidence rates of type 2 diabetes, we exploit the phase rollout of the programme. So as Beth has already mentioned, the programme itself was rolled out in three waves from 2016 to 2018. So the first wave began in June 2016, and the second and final wave um, in, each, in April each year after that. So for this analysis, we consider three time periods, pre-DPP, an implementation period, and then an effect period. So I've tried to show these in the figure on the slide. So the pre-DPP period is obviously 2010 to 2015, so before the DPP was introduced anywhere. The implementation period is shown in the sort of dashed purple line. And that's the period of time where a practice is enrolled in the DPP, but we don't yet expect to see a difference in type 2 diabetes rates during this time. So we think that because basically individuals must first be identified as having pre-diabetes before they can be offered a referral to the DPP. And then if they go on to accept that referral, the programme completion itself takes a minimum of nine months from first session attendance. So given this, we consider the implementation period from when the wave was introduced for a minimum of 18 months. And that 18 months is a minimum because obviously um, the first wave starts in June, but the second wave starts in April. So the effect period is then when we would expect to see a change in the type 2 diabetes incidence rates if the programme was actually effective at the population level. And the period of time with which this corresponds to for each wave is shown in the solid purple on the slide. So for our analyses, we compare rates of new type 2 diabetes in wave 1 practices during 2018 and 2019 compared to final wave practices in the same time period. And then we compare rates of type 2 diabetes amongst wave 2 practices to that of final wave practices in 2019. Importantly, we omit the implementation years from our analysis and consider only the pre-DPP period and the effect period. So to carry this all out, uh, we use difference and differences methods. Now, I'm, not sh I'm sure the majority of you will be very familiar with this, um, but just in case, I've tried to briefly outline the concept using the diagram below. So it basically involves the comparison of two groups. So one of which receives the interventional treatment and one which does not. So in this diagram, we're looking at a very simplified rate of type 2 diabetes. So we're comparing practices not in the DPP, which is the top line, and practices in the DPP, which is the bottom line. So in this example, we can see that prior to the introduction of the DPP in 2016, the trends in type 2 diabetes for these two groups are parallel. So that is that they are increasing at the same rate over time. And then once the DPP is introduced, this changes. So to measure the effect of an intervention, we compare what is actually observed after the DPP is introduced, which is that solid purple line, to the predicted trend line if all else remained constant i.e. the DPP hadn't been introduced, so that's the dotted line. And then the difference between the observed value and the predicted value is what is known as the difference in differences. 
So bringing this all together in our analysis, we use difference and differences methods, which we implement using Poisson regression models with random effects. And in these regressions, we also include a variety of practice um, population characteristics, and I've listed these on the slide. Finally, then, we also carry out several sensitivity analyses, and these basically vary the assumptions around the periods of implementation of effect. So one of the prerequisites for carrying out difference and differences analysis is to first test the parallel trends assumption. So on this slide um, are two graphs showing the rate of type 2 diabetes from 2010 to 2015, which is basically before the DPP was introduced. And this is for both wave one and wave two in comparison to the rates in the final wave practices. So we can see here that um, the trends in wave one incidence, which is the left graph, are very similar to those of the final wave practices. And this was con confirmed with the stati statistical test um, and on the right, which is wave two, the incidence rates were slightly lower, however, still very similar. So just to go on to our analysis sample. So the National Diabetes Audit itself contained information from participants registered to 7,413 unique general practices. And from these, we excluded those that did not consistently contribute to the National Diabetes Audit which um, totaled 351. Those registered with a pro um, practice population of less than 1,000, so that was 534, as well as those missing the practice and population covariates that we included in our regressions, that was 52. So all in all, we included 6,476 practices in our analysis sample. And this represented um, around 94% of England's total practices. And out of these, 50% uh, were enrolled in the first wave of the DPP, 25% were in wave two, and then 25% were in the final wave. So here we present the results of the regression. So the results are presented in terms of incident rate ratios. And again, I don't, I don't want to insult anyone by saying what they are, but um, an incident rate ratio of one, 0 0.00 suggests that there is no difference in type 2 diabetes incidence between the DPP practices and final wave practices, whereas an uh, incident rate ratio of less than one suggests that type 2 diabetes incidence is lower in the DPP practices compared to the final waves and vice versa. So our analysis here shows that type 2 diabetes rates in wave 1 practices were lower than what would have been expected in the absence of the DPP for the years of 2018 to 2019 combined with an incident rate ratio of 0.938. And this result was statistically significant at the 0.1% threshold. And in our analysis comparing wave two practices, we find that incidence of type two diabetes was lower again than would have been expected in the absence of the program. Um, and this was for 2019, with an incident rate ratio of 0.927. And this was statistically significant at the 5% threshold level. So using the results of our regression analysis and the number of type 2 diabetes cases that we actually observed, we can calculate the number of type 2 diabetes cases that would have been avoided due to the DPP. So for wave 1 practices, across 2018 to 2019, there were a total of 208,420 new cases of type 2 diabetes. So using the incident rate ratio of 0.938 from our analysis, we can work out that this would correspond to 222,196 cases in the absence of the DPP, or that 13,776 cases of diabetes were prevented. And performing similar calculations for the wave two practices suggests that 4,032 cases of type two diabetes were prevented or avoided in the year of 2019. Now onto our sensitivity analyses. Um, so I know that it actually looks quite a lot to take in, but I think the main thing to look at here is the pattern of results across each of the rows. So it's 
it's reassuring to see here that the estimates remain pretty consistent across all of the different time periods assumptions in suggesting that the incidence of type 2 diabetes is lower than what we would have expected in the absence of the program and this is also true for the wave 2 analyses so here we've basically done three things so we've looked at the instead of including years in the implementation period we've included them in the pre-period we've then changed the years um, that we can model effect by assuming that the implementation years go on the other end so go towards the effectiveness period and then for the wave one um, analysis we've modeled the effectiveness in the years separately so to conclude um, this is the first study to evaluate the population level impact of the nhs diabetes prevention program on new cases of type 2 diabetes across england our analysis has shown that practices enrolled in the dpp were associated with reduced incidence rates and that these remained robust across several sensitivity analyses. So next steps. Um, luckily, we've just found out that this paper has been accepted for publication, so that's really good. Um, in terms of next steps on the project, we will be focusing on evaluating the value for money that the DPP represents. And to do this, we aim to look at the cost effectiveness of the programme over the short term using the observed data and then to hopefully create a decision analytic model which will evaluate the cost effectiveness over the longer time horizon so yeah that's it from both beth and i um, thank you very much for listening and if you would like to get in contact with either of us about this work our emails on the screen so i'll hand back over to erin okay uh, thank you both for the excellent presentation. Um, so we're now going to invite attendees to use the Q&A function in the Zoom software menu. And anyone with further questions after today's webinar and after the Q&A is encouraged to email noaa.ca uh, with further questions. Um, so while the Q&A questions are coming in, I'll start off with a few of my own. Um, so first is, I I'm wondering how your results have compared to the clinical trials or sort of the pre-test rollouts that were done before the you know, national rollout of the program. Do you want me to take that one, Emma? Yeah, that's yeah. okay. <laughs> um, so it's kind of hard to compare them, essentially. Um, so the, the largest trial kind of outside of the US DPP was the um, was actually in, in England and it was the Norfolk DPP and I think they found a risk reduction of about 46%. So our our results kind of aren't too far off from, from what other trials have found. Um, but I think it's also important to understand that these different the, the kind of comparisons are highly kind of caveated. In, in the terms of we're, we're kind of comparing slightly different things. Um, our control group it isn't a true control group in, in the usual trial sense because because these people have been offered the DPP. They've just decided not to stake it up. Um, but also kind of there's other, other things like out, the outcomes are measured um, at different times. So our outcome relies on measurement within um, routine primary care compared to kind of within a trial um, follow-up setting. Um, so I think despite all of that, I think it's still quite encouraging to see that when these programmes are rolled out in routine care at scale, they, they are still proven to be effective. Yeah, that's. I feel like that's really encouraging agreement. It's a really nice result. Um, another question is, how is the retention in the program? Um, and has this changed over time like between waves? So you found a strong effect of retention and attending more sessions was really effective. Um, has this changed between waves? That's something I don't, I don't know if uh, other parts of our of, of diploma, the, the research package have, have analyzed that, but I don't think it's something that we've looked at. Um, do you, are you aware of that? Emma? No, I haven't. I have, sorry, I haven't. Um, we haven't looked at anything in between the waves, but there has actually been a sort of a re-procurement of the DPP, so that which is called Framework Two, 
And as part of that, they've actually changed the financial incentives for providers to sort of change retention rates for people from black and minority ethnic groups, and then also to incentivize weight loss as well. Um, so I think we, we, we do plan to look at retention in framework two, which has used those financial incentives compared to the original framework. Um, that's sort of next steps, not yet done. Oh, super interesting. Um, okay, so I'm gonna go to the questions. We've got a couple from Chris McCabe. Um, so Chris's first question, I think this one is for Beth, um, is have you considered looking at the engagement and through an intersectionality lens and how this might be impacting upon the effectiveness of the program? So I think we, we are planning to look at the um, impact of the program kind of within or between subgroups. And it's definitely something that we're planning to do, but in terms of engagement, I hate to say that it's, it's, a, it's um, the other work packages kind of realm, but it kind of is. Um, to, so is it work? I can't remember which work, which work package it is, but the, the kind of role is to look at um, equity in engagement, equity in access um, and, and those sorts of things. But it's definitely something that we're planning to do in terms of the outcomes and um, whether these vary by. Um, is, is that does that answer the question? Yeah, I think that does. I mean, it sounds like you're on it. It's just not necessarily yeah. within the scope of the work that you're yeah. doing. Personally. In terms of the outcomes, that's definitely our, our, our scope. Um, so we, we definitely will be looking at whether um, outcomes varied in, in, in different groups. And in your um, pre-test slides, you were showing the distribution of uptake and adherence by socioeconomic status. Did that end up staying in your regression models for the final estimation? Is that for me? Yes, Beth, sorry. Okay. Yeah, uh, yes, yes. So the the deprivation levels of deprivation quintiles were in the regression chain. Okay. Awesome. Okay, so another question um, from Chris. And again, I think this is a question for Beth. Um, so why did you categorize the number of sessions attended rather than using all of the information on the cardinal scale? Wouldn't the incremental effects of each additional session be useful for the cost effectiveness analysis? So I'm not sure I understand this. I thought that I thought we had um, at least looked at each individual session, do you mean kind of that we've included them as a categorical each individual session? Yeah, so if I'm understanding the question, I think it's about um, what's the rationale for the categories, like, you know, more than 60% completion um, or, you know, using the number of sessions attended. I think, um, I think this comes down to some of the issues that we have with the private providers. If I'm if I'm understanding it in any way. Um, so we were worried about presenting the sort of effectiveness for that final provider because they had an additional number of sessions so that they would be able to be picked out in comparison to the other three, um, if that makes any sense. Because when we're doing this analysis, because it's private providers, there's a lot of rules around how we present the data, how much information we give away about each of the different providers. So we're, sort of, we're not being censored, but we are sort of being limited in what we can show. But maybe I've missed the mark on what the actual question is. Oh, I think that's great. Um, okay, so Emma, I have a question for you, and I guess it's also a question for Beth, but I'll, I'll put it to Emma. Um, so is there any way that you think you could start to compare the um, the results across the two studies like for example could you take those individual level effects and start to aggregate them up to the population to look at agreement between your two sets of results yeah i think that would be really interesting um i was saying this to beth earlier because it it'd be because we've sort of cited that we might be capturing um effects that are broader than just individuals participating so we might be capturing the idea that more people are being identified with pre-diabetes and that in itself is preventing people from going on to develop the condition. Um, 
I'm sure there'll be loads of sort of caveats if we did try and aggregate up. Um, but yeah, I think that would be a really interesting next step. Thank you, Erin. Uh, Emma, one more question for you. Um, so can you say from your analysis whether um, diabetes has been delayed or has it been prevented? Yeah, so this is um, another sort of contentious point as well in that we're sort of framing it as being prevented, but it might in fact be that they've just delayed um, the diabetes diagnosis for X amount of time. And although we've heard from clinicians that the delay in itself would be quite useful, obviously prevention is the sort of key. Um, at the moment, I don't think we can sort of differentiate between the two because we don't have long enough follow-up. But when we do get sort of more years follow up that's hopefully something we can look into to see whether these sort of effects are maintained. Um, the issue is that COVID, COVID's happened so whilst we do have data up until 2021 um, unfortunately there's evidence sort of like published um, published diagnosis of type 2 diabetes just completely plummeted during 2020 and it doesn't appear that that has sort of um, that those diagnoses that were missed have been sort of added back on now. Um, so there are issues with the sort of follow-up data, which is why we sort of both stopped at 2020. Um, unfortunately, we would have liked to have gone on, but COVID has sort of given us, thrown us a curveball. But yeah, hopefully in the future, we can sort of look to see amongst those participants whether they are still um, without diabetes or whether it's sort of delayed it. Okay, well, thank you. Um, so that is it for the Q&A questions. So um, I think we'll conclude there. So thank you again, Dr. Parkinson and Ms. McManus uh, for your seminar. And thanks to everyone online for taking the time to attend today's rounds. Um, and you can subscribe to NOAA by visiting noaa.ca for upcoming events. Thanks again. Thank you.